over to the, uh, the official part of the regular now. Winston Scott is currently the Senior Vice President for External Relations and Economic Development at the Florida Institute of Technology, Florida Tech. Excuse me. He's also a professor of aeronautics in the College of Aeronautics, and at a point early in his career, he was the dean of the School of Aeronautics in the George Scurlo uh, building. Uh, Winston has most recently served as the dean of the uh, School of Aeronautics. He is retired U.S. Navy captain and a naval aviator. During his Navy career, Captain Scott served as an anti-submarine warfare helicopter pilot flying the SH-2F helicopter. He served as a fighter pilot flying the F-14. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is the applause for Winston or for the faculty? <laughs> <laughs> Winston, you lose the airplane. <laughs> He also served as a production test pilot flying the A-7 Corsair and the F-18 Hornet. <laughs> that person, interesting enough, unfortunately his wife couldn't be with us today. Uh, Winston has a son who is an F-18 pilot. Okay? And you can imagine the dinner table conversations <laughs> with Marilyn saying she's married to an F-14 pilot and her son is an F-18 pilot. <laughs> he also served as a production while flying in Corsair and the F-18, as I said. Uh, he has uh, flown a number of airplanes. He's got 6,000 hours of flight time in more than 25 different military and civilian aircraft and more than 200 shipboard landings. The, uh, Winston Scott was selected to become an astronaut in 1992. He served as a mission specialist flying two space shuttle missions, flying on space shuttles both Endeavour and Columbia. He's logged over 24 days in space, including three spacewalks, totally over 19 hours. Captain Scott earned a BA in music and an MS degree in aeronautical engineering. He holds honorary doc uh, doctorate degrees from Florida Atlantic University and Michigan State University. He's held numerous leadership positions in academia, the government, and private industry. He serves on several corporate and not-for-profit advisory boards uh, throughout the East Coast. He's a member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Aircraft Operators and Pilots Association, the Tailhook Association, Naval Helicopter Association, and the Experimental Aircraft Association. Captain Scott maintains an active public speaking schedule but the part of it that is really interesting in many respects is, despite all of that technical expertise, he's a all of that background, and I can personally attest to this, he is a super trumpet player, <laughs> playing jazz music. He plays a jazz trumpet with various bands along the Space Coast. His book, Reflections from Earth Orbit, was published by Collector's Guide Publishing Company in 2005. Without further ado, a very good friend, and I can say that proudly, Winston Scott. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Bob, for that wonderful introduction. Thanks to you folks. I'm going to stand over here eventually to, to go through the presentation, but let me start off by first of all thanking you for having me out here this afternoon. I have visited with uh, uh, Drummer, the different, I guess, chapters of Drummond retirees over the past few years, there's been a, 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 a few since I've been here, so it's good to get me back. Some of you may have met me before, some of you may be meet for the first time here, but I'm glad to be here. It, uh, it, it truly is an honor because as I sat here and uh, talking to Scott, talking to Bob, and, uh, and, and finding out some of the things that you folks uh, have done in your career and then experiencing a little bit in my career, I feel like the, the roles should be reversed. You should be up here giving a presentation. I should be sitting up here listening to you. And I mean that sincerely. It's just incredible the things that you folks in your role as a Grumman employees accomplished over the years. And I see everybody from, from corporate. I see Miss Marie out there. I got to meet you a few years back. It's good to see you. And, 
Marty and George during my uh, uh, dean days there at, at Florida Tech, got to know you a little bit. And then uh, all the, the program managers, the design engineers, the, the secretaries, the clothes out, I guess they'll call them clothes, like the pad uh, guys, you know, the pad folks are near and dear to my heart. You know, not just during my shuttle days, but during my airplane days too, because the, I guess the, the equivalent would be our Navy plane captains, the people that actually do the final inspection on that airplane before you go off the front end of the boat. You know, those people, those people can really make the difference between life and death. So my hat's off to you all. I tell you what, it really is an honor to be in a room. You folks uh, have done some amazing things, and I'm just honored and all to be here. You all want to write some books or something, publish some of these stories. But having said all that, you didn't come to hear me talk about you. You came to hear me uh, give a little bit of a presentation. I'm going to do that here in just a little bit. But you mentioned earlier, which we'll, you, you clapped about the, uh, the part about the F-14. I tell you, in all the airplanes I've ever flown, the Tomcat is my favorite. That is a fine machine. And, uh, and uh, it, it's funny how politics get in the way of things. You were talking about Drummond winning a contract to win to build the show. And then politics got in the way and went someplace else. Well, I can tell you another time politics got in the way. I was the, uh, I was the deputy director of the Tactical Aircraft Systems Department at the Naval Air Development Center. Uh, PAX, PAX was the Naval Air Test Center, and you probably know that NADC was the Naval Air Development Center. What we did was did uh, research, development, testing, evaluation of aircraft systems. And we actually bred, boarded, and flew the systems on airplanes. So I was on the tactical side of it. I flew the Tomcat, the A7, the F-18 there. And uh, during my last couple of years, just before my NASA days, the, the call was out to do one or two things. The Navy could either buy more F-14Ds or buy what is now the Super Bowl, the F-18EF. My department actually did all the analyses, and we recommended that the Navy buy more F-14Ds. Politicians now get involved and say, Sam, shut up, we're going to buy F-18 uh, EFs, and the rest is history. So politics gets in the way, but we recommended recommended Tom Kansas. Good airplane. Okay, take what? I'm going to go and relatively quickly through a, a slide and uh, presentation. If you can't see, please bring your chairs up. This is real informal, so that you can see. I'm trying to go through it relatively quickly, and hopefully, I don't know how my time is going to run. We can uh, uh, have some two-way conversation if you like, and uh, we'll go from there. So let's go on and get started. First of all, uh, my introductory slide, that's in that upper left-hand corner picture, that was taken as an astronaut candidate many, many years ago. This one on the lower right-hand side was taken more recently. Don't I look exactly the same? <laughs> exactly. Well, that one of the I did on my phone, I haven't changed one bit. So. Wishful thinking. Let's see. Where's the uh? Where's the thing? Where's the thing? Yeah, we should. Uh, there we go. All right. There's one that everybody's familiar with. The Tomcat going off of the uh, off of the the cat. I did my first uh, top uh, landings on the Kitty Hawk, and this is not me. That's just a stock picture. And they did some on the John F. Kennedy, and, and uh, my main ship was the USS Nimitz. Air Wing 8, I wish you had a big thing, but anyway, again, I had a good, uh, fun airplane. And my son, uh, like Bob said, an F-18 pilot on that duty now, so we're real proud of him. Another Tomcat picture way back in the day, uh, this was at Warminster. I don't remember what that flight was that I came back from, but I can tell you a system that we have on board the, uh, the point now called uh, Non-Corporate Target Recognition System, NTCR. I asked my son one day, uh, if he, if he, if he calls sometimes we talk and I said, uh, you guys have NCTR? And he said, oh yeah, we do. In fact, I fired it up today. Non-cooperative target recognition system. And I said, yeah, well your dad was the first one to fly that system because we developed it at Warminster. Well, we developed it and we flew it in the F-14. And that time it was a breadboard system uh, bolting into the, in, into the cockpit in the Rio. The rig on this stuff also had the display in the back. Very, very basic system that has evolved now into a fully operational system that the, the fleet is using. But we first flew on the top, yeah. You can see a little bit of a P3 over here. Yeah, DC was an interesting place, just like Pax River. We had a whole cadre of airplanes, helicopters, frost, jets, and so on. I was fortunate enough to be able to fly the Tomcat and some of the others there. Let's see what's next. 
Another Tomcat picture. This one was taken just after I was selected for astronaut training. I was still at Warminster, and the press came around. They take all these pictures and all. That has become kind of a Winston's got classic. I was in the cockpit. They took that picture, and it was in their news, local newspapers. This is not me either, but that's my squadron. I actually flew with the F-84 and, uh, and the Jolly Rogers. You see, that was a little bit fuzzy. It's somebody shooting the Phoenix. I never got to fire a Phoenix. I got to, uh, very few people did. Very few. You guys probably know this better than I do. But I fired sparrows and winders. And if I had a dollar for every bullet I shot at that gun, I could uh, take my wife out to dinner and buy something. But, uh, but again, just really a, a, a fine airplane, the best combination of, of a overall tactical airplane performance that, that could be built. It, it, it well ahead of its time. And even after all of these years, I can still remember a lot of the systems and the modes and the performance capabilities. I, I could talk about it all day long and not uh, get into all of it. But anyway, just, just really fun, fun airplane. Let's see what's next. Uh, my background with Norman, though, doesn't really go back into the, the lunar module days. You know, that was a little bit before my time. But, you know, my space shuttle days really have, have a link. And, uh, of course, I had two space shuttle missions, as you heard in the uh, presentation. My first mission was with these folks here on board Endeavour, which was the newest of the shuttles. My second one was on board Columbia with these folks here, which was the oldest. So, nine days on the newest Endeavour, 16 days on the oldest Columbia. Uh, six guys, five guys, one woman, international crews. You know, this guy here, Leonid Kadinyuk, was a former Soviet Union fighter pilot and cosmonaut. Well, now in my day, there are we're all buds, and he's flying with us on the uh, space shuttle now from, from the Ukraine, the former Soviet Union. So, so this is my Columbia crew posing in front of my T-38s. Now I have to admit, uh, if, if I had to go to, my favorite combat airplane was the F-14. But in terms of just sports car, <laughs> this thing here, this thing, you, and you recognize this, is the T-38. And these are the NASA T-38s. NASA T-38s were a little bit different from the stock Air Force, but now we'll go into all the differences. But that thing was fast. It's like a Ferrari in the sky. I mean, you're out for everything. For a little bit of little bit of gas. I take off from Houston an hour and a half later, I land in Cape. And then train all day long, take off an hour and a half later, I land back in South Houston. So no way to worry if you live on the airline, but you can do it in these bad boys. When I retired, I tried to get them to let me keep one. <laughs> and they said, no, dude, you can retire, we just gotta leave the jet here. That's our Columbia crew in front of our T 38s. Uh, you heard my a little bit in the introduction. I had two jobs on the shuttle. Actually, I was a flight engineer for the uh, flying parts of flight, MS-2. The shuttle was really operating about three people. You had the commander and the pilot, and then you had MS-2 as kind of like a flight engineer. So I had to do all of the asset entry systems. I do all of the systems that actually had operated the vehicle. Uh, my commander was good enough to let me fly it. So I can truthfully say I actually flown the, the space shuttle. I was like a scientist in the pilot. I was a flight engineer. My main job was spacewalking. And the way we trade for EVA, you, probably, you may or may not know, is underwater. So this picture down here, the picture of my buddy and I underwater practicing what we're going to do in space. It's not exactly the same thing because underwater, you're still in 1G. But if the suit can be weighed out so that such things neutrally buoyant, the water sort of floats the suit, you pretend you're in 0G. Now, this suit weighs 350 pounds. That's right. So you, those straps lead to a crane. So we'll get closed up in the suit. I'm on this side. My buddy's on the other side of the donning stand. We get the helmets on, gloves on. Then the crane will pick us up, move us out over the water, and lower us into the water. And then what you don't see is all the scuba divers around. Uh, Joyce, the scuba divers under there will swim us down to the uh, uh, practice area, and they'll work with us and help us train all day long and they'll also see to our safety because if something goes wrong underwater you can't swim in that suit you can't walk in it you dip in on the scuba diving to get you out of there so we spend on average about 10 hours underwater for every one hour we spend actually walking in space so just a picture of us uh, training underwater space is truly an amazing place because up there the weight disappears 
the suit doesn't weigh anything, but you still have 350 pounds of mass on your body that you're moving, in addition to your body mass and your tools and so on. You can, you're can you easily moving uh, several hundred pounds of mass around, and then on occasion, you may move thousands of pounds of mass in space. So it's, it's physically very demanding. It's the most demanding thing we do in space. Uh, the Columbia crew on the morning of launch, we just finished breakfast. We're going to get our weather brief, get our launching entry suits on, then we'll go out to the pad. There we go, I'm in the suit up room, I'm getting my launching entry suit on. The suit technician is adjusting the neck ring. And let's see, let's move ahead. We're all suited up and we're leaving crew quarters. We have been quarantined for eight days in crew quarters, during which we only eat what's prepared for us by the dietitians and only come in contact with people who've been cleared by the doctors. And you guys are very familiar with that ritual. What you don't see here also is the convoy of vehicles. We, we will board the uh, crew transport vehicle. Sim I guess similar to a vehicle the guys used back in the Apollo days, the little silver bus. And uh, you've got the SWAT team over here, the helicopters and the security folks and all of them that, that will take out to the pad. This is probably four, four and a half hours before actual liftoff. We've jumped ahead, we're at the launch pad. It's my turn to climb in. We've been up to the 195 foot level. And uh, this hatch is actually a hatch leading to the shuttle. These guys are the suit technicians, of course, in the white room. A couple of people are already inside, but because of where my seat's located, it's my turn to climb in next. This is probably, again, four hours of there about before I actually lift off. And this is a picture of the shuttle at lift off. And again, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this, is, this part was called the orbiter, because it went into orbit, and the solid rocket boosters, one here and one on the other side, and then the external tank. This thing produced 7.5 million pounds of thrust at liftoff, and the majority of that came from the solid rocket boosters. It, it, it weighed about 4.5 million, the whole stack, it produced about 7.5 million pounds of thrust at liftoff, just an amazing, uh, Experience. It probably, I think it was probably more benign than the uh, than the Saturn V. I think the Saturn V was a little more violent. This was a little more smooth ride. It would take, it would take off and, and, and it's like it gradually accelerate up. But anyway, just just an amazing uh, piece of engineering. And now we should have video of the launch. There we go. At seven seconds. Before liftoff, the ground launch sequence computer would ignite the main engines if all three engines ignited and accelerated properly. And sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. More often than not, they did. Then the solids would ignite. And once, as you know, once the solids ignite, you're going someplace. You can't stop it. You won't go. This looks like slow motion, but uh, in reality, it jumps off the path. It, it would kick you in the butt. And uh, it, it surprised me on my first flight how, how it boom, sort of kicks you in the back. And by the time you pass the top of the tower, you have exceeded 100 miles per hour. You pass Mach 1 in roughly 45 seconds, and this thing just keeps going faster and faster. You watch your gauges, Mach 4, Mach 5, Mach 6, Mach 8, and so on. My first flight, we launched at night, so obviously it was dark out there, but about halfway through the ascent, I could look out ahead and see the day half of Earth coming. So we went from sitting on the pad to 17,500 thereabouts in only eight and one half minutes. Just an absolutely incredible ride. It just kept, kept going faster and faster and faster. There's nothing else in existence that just never stops accelerating. But it's a rocket, that's what it's supposed to do. So let's see, we carry many, many different uh, devices in the orbit with us. This thing is a solar observation satellite, the Spark 206. And you can see it's on the end of the robot arm. It's our robot arm operator lifting up out of the payload bay, placed it in the orbit, and then we were supposed to back away from it for 48 hours. It was going to make measurements of the sun's corona. Then we fly back up to it, grab it with the arm, put it back in the bay and bring it home. And then the scientists on the ground could download its data and learn more about the sun. Well, the satellite malfunctioned, and, it, uh, and the malfunction resulted in a very slow spin. This is a 3,000 pound satellite. Very, very slowly spinning in space. Well, it's very expensive, so you can't just leave it up as a piece of junk. But because it's spinning, we can't catch it with the robot arm. So 
So a great dilemma exists that we had to figure out how to get that sound like that. I'll tell you a little bit about that here in just a bit. Uh, jump ahead, uh, this is Takao Doi from Japan, Japanese astronaut, obviously. He and I are in the airlock preparing to go outside on our first spacewalk of this mission. I was on my second mission, Takao was on his first. And um, before we do that, we had to put on the appropriate undergarment. You would think working in space, space is cold and you have to keep astronauts warm. A bigger problem is keeping us from overheating because the suit is so well insulated. When you work, you can build up a heat loading and you overheat yourself. So the suit has an active cooling system. And if you look at this garment, this is called a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. You can see those little the little lines, those little circular things, those that's plastic tubing. That plastic tubing runs all up and down the suit. And the chilled water is pumped up and down that suit to keep your body cool. You can adjust the temperature of that chilled water to keep you from overheating. So anyway, we put on our long jobs first, then the liquid cooling and ventilation garment. Then you put the space suit itself on over that. You know, it's the classic backpack. I've got headphones, microphones. Look how big and bulky those gloves are. Computer on the front to monitor suit functions. And it would tell you everything that's going on with the suit, how healthy it is, what the battery power is, what the water level is, temperature, your pressure, humidity, uh, current flow, uh, everything uh, uh, about the suit is contained in that, uh, is monitored by the computer. But obviously, you could not live very long in space with a serious suit malfunction. So you want the suit operating properly. You want to know the status of it at all times. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's jump ahead. We should get our helmets up. Ah, we've jumped ahead of, of, of quite a bit. And the satellite, that malfunction, the, it was finally decided after days of discussion that the way to get it was to cow guy when have to go outside and catch it by hand. So we've jumped ahead several days now. We're outside. I'm on the left. The cow's on the right. We've locked our boots in the foot restraints. That will hold our bodies in place so we have both hands free. Our commander flew us up to the shuttle. Then I had to direct him as to how to maneuver us so that we could get it. The satellite had sharp edges. You had to be careful where you touch. And then we had to start and stop every motion uh, in a coordinated fashion because 3,000 pounds of mass can very easily get away from us. We used to lose control over it and uh, either injure ourselves or damage something. So here you see us uh, uh, making a satellite capture. Notice the earth is vertical to us there. I can remember very well when we were doing this how disorienting that was as our commander rotated the shuttle. I could see the earth begin to tilt out of the corner of my eye. When the earth tilts, you feel as though you're falling. And instinctively, you want to right yourself. Well, I can't right myself because the shoulder's moving. I'm attached to it. And you talk about vertigo. For those of you who've who flown airplanes and experience vertigo, this is the worst kind of uh, space in vertigo. But just like in flight training, when the instructors used to tell us, when you get vertigo, concentrate on your instruments. You have to ignore your feelings. Believe your instruments. I remember thinking to myself, I don't have any instruments. But then, uh, it takes me longer to tell it than to think it. I thought, I'm just concentrating on the satellite. It's stable. It's not going anywhere. So I mentally tuned out my environment with the horizons and just concentrated on that satellite. And then this, you see where we are now. And we were able to, to catch that. So. Um, took three and a half hours to actually make the capture of several days of uh, planning in three and a half hours. Let's see if we get some motion going on here. See if you can see the last. Uh, it's not, uh... There we go. Yeah, not yet. I'm not getting the fine control over it like I normally do. You know, sometimes these things are... Uh... <laughs> there we go, okay.
Okay. I, I, my time, I think, is getting short, so I'm going to kind of speed things up. Just another picture of myself outside there handling a uh, large battery. That square thing is a space station battery, over 400 pounds on Earth. I can have it by myself up there. This looks like a soccer ball. It's really a robot. Its eyes are stereoscopic television cameras. Everything the robot sees could be beamed back into the shuttle on mission control. You could use the robot to inspect the outside of your vehicle and if you detect damage, send people. I launched it, our pilot flew through a uh, test profile and then I caught it and put it back inside. Just another picture of myself on the left and Takao on the right, spacewalking, testing a crane. Orbital sunrise, the upper left hand corner, that's orbital sunrise. We're moving away from you into the screen. If this were moving, you see the sun peak up over the horizon. We go around the Earth every 90 minutes. So you see the sun rise and set 16 times every 24 hour period of time. This is one of my favorite pictures because it turns up everywhere. Coffee table books, yeah. the Museum of Science in London, England, even those old fashioned church fans. I have even produced several thousand of those church fans of this picture on it. African American History Month. It turns up here. If you Google me, that picture will come up. But I'm not getting any royalties from it yet, so something's wrong here. Re-entry, you can see the uh, glow outside. That is actually simply ionized air because at one point during the landing of the approach sequence, we're going so fast through the air that it actually ionizes. Uh, that's, all, that's what that hot plasma is out there. The pictures don't do it justice. The temperature outside is in the thousands of degrees. The highest is about 3,000 degrees. We're comfortable, so you have the suits on the helmets on inside, we've got suits on. So the environmental control system is working well, and we're comfortable inside. That's, that, that's incredible when you see it in real life. It's like riding inside of a fireball, because you actually are inside of a big fireball. And now, we're just about ready to land. We've jumped ahead over an hour. And we're turning on to final at uh, Kennedy Space Center. That's the heads up display, which many of you will recognize. The computer generates a picture of the, an overlay of the runway so that we can find it. Remember, the shuttle had no engines, so you had to spot the runway, do the approach, and land right the first time. Yeah, of course, our commander is still doing the flying. The hood has been decluttered. You have 14 guys, you, know, you can declutter the hood. Okay, there's air speed over there, there's altitude, R is radar out temperature, there's runway up there, we start the flare. If the landing gear is lower, and then uh, commander just squeaks it on a nice uh, landing. We came from orbit on the opposite side of the Earth, all the way around to a landing and, and, uh, at, on the ground with no engines. And it's just a, an amazing testament to the folks that designed it. I won't spend a lot of time here, but. If, if this is just before landing, obviously. It looks unremarkable, but you know this, an amazing vehicle. It launches like a rocket, you live in it like a space station, you land it like an airplane, and then you turn it around and reuse it. We should really be, you, we uh, should be flying these things right now. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I won't go too much in my political speech. Yeah. 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 Touchdown, you saw, and then we got the six happy faces back from 16 days. In orbit. Okay, I realized that was real quick, but uh, I think my time is kind of short. I don't know if we have time Anything at all? Any F 14 uh, question? Or, uh, I'm going from D orbit to landing. From D orbit to the, the D orbit burn occurs and then it takes about 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so before you actually impact the atmosphere and then another hour to the time you land. So from the burn to landing is an hour and 20 minutes or so from orbital interface to land is by an hour, roughly. Yes? No, you know what? It's interesting. When we lost Columbia, there were a lot of articles in my Aviation Week actually pulled out that picture that you saw with me. It was in Aviation Week. And they talked about that project and how if Columbia had had that, possibly they could have detected the damage on the wing. No money. Bunch of cuts again. Here we go. Our government, your government at work. We were very short sighted. We flew that one flight on it, it was shelled and never used. Yes, sir. Could you compare the dynamics of, of an F-14 landing to the shuttle? Yeah, the shuttle is like landing a truck. I, I never actually landed the shuttle. Only the simulation, the command that gets to do the landing. But it's like it's a big airplane. It's like landing a big airplane, like driving a truck. Whereas the, the Tomcat, even on final, is a, it's a fighter. It's, it's maneuverable. 
They're very much more responsive. Yet the uh, glide slope that you have to fly on the on the shuttle, I mean on the uh, uh, in the Tomcat is different because the glide slope is moving. The ship is moving. The glide slope actually moves around. But the airplane is very responsive on flying when you can land it. Here you fly a nice steady glide slope with a less maneuverable vehicle, but the runway is not moving. So yeah. yeah. And here you got good weather, and uh, let's see, we landed our first thing at night, though, here I can command the the landing, but the runway is not moving. So, uh, total uh, is similar in some ways, different in other ways. This thing it is, is a big truck. The Tomcat was a, a very, very good, maneuverable, agile fighter, just an amazing combination. Of, of, uh, How there. rare is it for a naval aviator to end up flying both helicopters and jets? It's fairly, uh, well, it's, it's not all that rare. The TPS guys, everybody goes, TPS gets to fly some helicopters. It's unusual that you get to fly as much as I did on both. They do a touring both. It's kind of unusual. So, yeah. I can say myself lucky. Yes. After you landed, how long did it take you to get your sea legs back? Yeah, it didn't take us very long. Different people react when they get different lengths of time. We were up relatively short. We think it's 16 days in orbit. We all walked off the shuttle. It was a, it, 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 it's a very careful walk because we're a little bit unsteady and unstable. But we worked out an exercise that so we were in pretty decent shape coming off the shuttle. I have seen people come up because when, when you're not flying, you have other jobs acting as support astronaut. I've seen other people come back from space, and some of them are not able to walk off very well at all. Now, Scott Kelly, you probably know, just yeah. arrived back here. Yeah. And I know, in fact, Scott uh, and Mark are F-14 guys. Yeah, Scott Kelly is twin brother Mark, a Tomcat guy. I know, I know them. Uh, Scott just came off, and they didn't show the whole thing, but but they were lifting him out on the on the chair. Now, it probably was not necessary. Scott probably could walk. But after 340 days up there, yeah. they'll lift him off, they'll, they'll begin his reacclimation very, very slowly and very carefully so that he doesn't injure himself with stress fractures or, or bone uh, uh, breaks and things like that. So different people reacclimate at different lengths of time, but it also depends on how long you're up there. What was your sensations and feelings when you first left the space shuttle? But when I left, first left the space shuttle on my first space walk, of course, I was already acclimated to zero G because I'd been there for several days. But I had not had that big, massive, bulky suit on. So it took me a while to get used to the suit and then manipulating yourself and zero gravity in that heavy suit. Uh, in the water, the water actually dampens your movement and it's easy to stabilize it. And the water supports you. You don't have that up there. So you have to really be careful. You sort of get yourself calibrated to, uh, to and I can remember the first time I floated up to the top of the sill and, uh, and wanted to stop myself. I almost lost control. The suit almost kind of overpowered me and flipped me over. So I managed to stop myself. And then you have a few minutes just to translate along to sort of to calibrate your, your, your movements and so on. So, that sensation was going on. The other sensation was just one of utter amazement. When you're outside, things are totally different. And I can remember looking over the sill outside, looking down at the earth as we were moving. I, I, got, I could see the speed at which we were crossing. And I also got the feeling that I was going to tumble over and just fall to the ground. Yeah, <laughs> when you're in space, in orbit, you are falling. That's how you say you're actually falling around the earth. I got the sensation. I want to fall and hit. I think I instinctively grip those those handrails. So, uh, so many different sensations go through your your mind when you're up there doing something like this. So. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you think the uh, 18 E and F and the 35, the F 35, are up to handling the latest Russian and Chinese? You know, I'll tell you what, that, that's a real, a real thing. I know things are being recorded here, too. So I like that. I, 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 still think, uh, I still think that we are the greatest uh, engineering and technological country in the world. And I think we develop design and building and develop some of the best equipment in the world. I think the F-18 is an excellent platform for what we see right now, and that's... Uh, air ground um, 
I ISIS type of uh, groups, terrorist groups. They're in an all out shooting air to air war. I think the, well, they'd be the 22 and the 35 when it comes online. They have a lot of technical 22. 35. The 22 uh, is a magic airplane, and the 35 is going to be equal as good when they get the bugs worked out. My concern is the price limits us to how many we can buy. And the question in my mind is will I want to have one F-22 or four or five good old-fashioned Tomcats? That, that's the question in my mind. And that's, this is an honor. I'm not just saying because this is the F-14, uh, the Tom, the Grumman group here, but I kind of, I, I wrestle with that. If I were the decision maker, I might want to have good old, four or five good old-fashioned Tomcats than one magic airplane. And no matter how much magic is, only one of them. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about the time again? Well, let me thank you guys for inviting me and uh, we'll uh, be taking pictures. Thank you. I'm going to uh, circulate a petition. I have now found the next president of the United States. <laughs> Second time that I've heard Winston Skyhawk. I'm looking forward to another time that I've listened to him. That was very good, very informative. There's no such thing as having a program like this without having a commercial.